Uh, good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in Session 5. I'd like to remind members uh, and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers, can you please ensure that they're turned to silent? Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four on the committee expert support in private. Are members content to do that? Yes. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the implications of the EU referendum for Scotland. And today the focus is on the rights of EU nationals. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today to the meeting. Professor Eleanor Spaventa of Dur Durham University. Professor Dmitry Kochinov, Chair of EU Constitutional Law at the University of Groningen. Brendan Donnelly, Director of the Federal Trust and former MEP. Uh, Sundar Kadwala, Director of British Future. And via video conference, Professor Catherine Barnard, Professor of European Law at the University of Cambridge. Uh, welcome. This is obviously a, a very big subject and our, our committee has been uh, studying uh, the European single market membership in, in some detail and in, I think it's fair to say that in Scotland quite a large part of the debate around the referendum has focused on the single market. I think probably what struck many members um, from our, uh, our briefings um, from s some of the witnesses and um, indeed from our advisor Shona Douglas Scott is that even membership of the single market will not address any of these issues um, relating to uh, EU citizenship. So I wonder perhaps just as a sort of like general opening question, uh, what, if, you, if you could perhaps tell us what you think the biggest challenges are in terms of the issue of EU citizenship, both for EU citizens living here uh, in Scotland and the UK and uh, Scottish and UK citizens living in Europe. Um, Mr Donnelly, would you like to start? Uh, well, I'm afraid I'd have to give a rather evasive answer, which is that the problem is the problem of Brexit. Um, that citizenship, it seems to me, can't be distinguished from the general question of leaving the European Union, or more precisely, what Britain's relationship with the EU will be once it's left the European Union. There's been, there have been complaints and, and criticisms of the government as lacking a Brexit strategy. <laughs> I, th I think that's a, a, a misstatement. <laughs> Um, they have a Brexit strategy, which is to leave the European Union. The problem is what you're going to do in the post-Brexit uh, environment. Um, and you know, raised a number of specific questions um, put to, to witnesses um, uh, about the rights of citizens. Um, and obviously those rights won't be there as European citizens because we would have left the European Union under the government's hypothesis. The question is what future rights and reciprocal rights and obligations can be negotiated in the post-Brexit phase, and that we don't know the answer to. Um, and I'm sure it will come up in the, in the testimony that there are many barriers, both intellectual and political, to getting a clear picture of that, what, what that will be. Professor Kochinov? Yes, these are set times for EU citizenship, actually, but uh, I think we, we shouldn't stick to the name too much. So I, I would support the, the previous claim. I mean, the, the, core, the core focus should be on rights. So however the relationship is called, the rights in question are fundamental. And in this respect, uh, I, I, tried to, I tried to look at the implications of Brexit in the context of citizenship. So I called to the report on the quality of nationality, and there is a quality of nationality index, which is, which is based on uh, transparent num numerical data. And what we see, if there is no agreement reached in terms of free movement of persons with the EU, then the quality of British citizenship, and the quality of the citizenship that Scots enjoy as well, is likely to drop by 30%. If, if, you, if, 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 you, if you look at the data available, and all is very transparent, which means that British passport will be at the level of Argentinian passport. So it's, it's, a, it's a drastic drop in the quality of the rights that citizens enjoy. And in this sense, uh, all kinds of alarm bells should be ringing. So uh, and, 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 and another thing, uh, witnessing this, we should also realize that Brexit creates a new context of engagement between, between Europe and the UK. Before it was, the, it, it was a context of loyalty, where self-help was prohibited by the European Court of Justice. So there was no reciprocity. 
And once the UK is talking Brexit, we are speaking about reciprocal relations where, where retaliation is possible. And in this context, it's the UK versus the European Union, a relationship in which the UK is, is overwhelmingly weak uh, because, uh, because of the comparative importance of the two, of the two parties. Well, no offence to the people of Argentina, but that, that statement is really quite, you know, um, striking. Um, could you maybe define what, um, what you mean by so this quality of national, yeah, the quality of nationality index uh, was designed together with Handley and Partners, a leading firm that, uh, that deals in, in citizenship matters. So we looked at, at the economic strength of the, of the, of the parties concerned, the, the, uh, the territory associated with the citizenship, plus free movement for tourist reasons in terms of uh, short-term stays, visa-free, and settlement abroad with your passport, which entitles you to work and to, and to reside as long as you want uh, without, without applying for any authorizations. And in this sense, the, 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 the fact that UK citizens will not be able to benefit from free movement drastically reduces the quality of, of the rights they enjoy. Because the, the, the main added value of EU citizenship, of course, is that it extends the same rights as national citizenship already provides to the, to the holders, but multiplies them by factor 28. So while UK citizens, by virtue of UK law, can reside in the UK, can, can enjoy non-discrimination in the UK, and can work in the UK, by virtue of EU law before Brexit, they can, they can enjoy exactly the same rights in 27 more states. So the issue of scale is fundamental here. And then the, the, the loss of this, the loss of scale and the loss of the territory of rights, or the territory where rights can be legitimately claimed based on EU citizenship, which corresponds to 27 other EU member states, uh, leads to this drastic decrease in quality. No idea, surely what the terms of Brexit are going to be. So how can you make any of course, so, about so, free so this, this, this mechanical exercise was, was simply done on the assumption that there is no free movement. So we're speaking about very, very hard Brexit. And then, uh, as far as I understand, the, the, the purpose of this, uh, of this sitting is to see what, what kind of alternatives we have. So uh, in, in my view, with the view from across the channel, uh, it, it should be fundamental and imperative to make sure that the EU citizens, uh, that uh, British citizens do not lose uh, this factor 28 extra rights that the EU citizenship now, in, uh, now allows them to enjoy. Clarify, you mentioned Argentina. Are, are there other nations that, uh, as well as Argentina? Yeah, well, uh, so Argentina would is... Would that include is, the United States so or there are, Japan or Australia? I mean, would it include every other nation in the world other than the European nations? So the, so the index... Yeah, I, I will explain. <laughs> right. the, 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 index, the index measures the quality of nationality of all the nations in the world over the last five years. And then there are, there are several tires of quality of nationality. The highest tire... Uh, in, in, is, is the range between, between the quality of German nationality, which is the highest quality, and Argentina, which is the lowest and the highest tire. This is, this is the uh, fi top 50% uh, of quality available at all, uh, if, if we count the best nation, which is Germany as maximum, as, as 100. So the US, Japan, uh, Brazil, all, all, the, all the leading wealth, wealthy nations are above, which means that the this 30% decrease is something quite unprecedented because we also looked at the, at, at the dynamic relationship between, between citizenships around the world. So how citizenship quality decreases over the last five years. And the, the, the fastest decreasing nations are Ukraine, Syria, Libya, Bahrain. So all those that, that undergo conflict or are in economic trouble. And there we're speaking about decreases uh, in the range of 10%, not 30%, which will be the case with the UK. So, so the UK is, is an absolute outlier if, if we're speaking about the possibility of a hard Brexit. Um, your index, uh, hasn't actually been submitted to us. Would it be possible for the committee to see some written evidence of your index? Thank you very Absolutely. much. I know that Mr. Katwala want, wants to come in now. Um, well, we're going to have some very complex negotiations that haven't begun yet um, and that we don't know, therefore, even the starting positions or the outcomes. Um, and they will affect everybody in Scotland and everybody in Britain in lots of ways. The most pressing and urgent question is the three million Europeans who are living uh, now in the UK, 150,000 of them in Scotland, um, over a million Brits around the EU. Now, in the case of the um, European nationals living in uh, Scotland and across the UK, there is no barrier 
in terms of having these negotiations or beginning these negotiations to the UK, determining their future status beyond Brexit and the status that they will have. The only thing that requires to be negotiated is the protection of the UK nationals around the EU. That, you know, there could be a decision to link these questions or to separate these questions, but it's entirely up to the UK government if it wants to give the European nationals in Britain uh, an assurance of their status. What has to happen, therefore, is a political decision, is that the current status of um, permanent residence is linked to our EU membership. You would have to invent a new status that was identical to it. This is a very similar proposition to the overall Repeal Act. The Repeal Act will incorporate everything that currently exists in European law into UK law, and then we'll start there. So you need to invent um, a version of what is currently permanent residence. You could call it an ex-EU status, and you should give it all of the same rights that EU nationals currently have, and the UK government could do that right now, or say that it was doing that. So the, the biggest barrier, really, to the assurance there is a political decision to give these people that commitment. Yeah, I think Professor Spaventa would like to come in. Yeah, and I very much agree with that point, and I think there are two issues. First of all, don't underestimate the cooling effect this is having on migration in terms of very skilled people. And we have evidence in my institution of this having already happened in the past six months. And for us, this is obviously a real problem. And so if the UK government were to clarify as soon as possible what are the rights of those people who might come or are already here, I think um, universities and businesses and those relying on very high skilled uh, jobs would find it very helpful. Um, and my second point is that, um, actually I have added two points. I think uh, there is a way whereby we can say European law already protects UK citizens uh, when they are, uh, who are resident now in the EU, even after Brexit. The real problem is uh, EU citizens here. And uh, if we think about uh, those most vulnerable pensioners are at a real risk. Both pensioners who are here, UK pensioners who are here, uh, um, EU pensioners who are here, and UK pensioners abroad, and we know that we have almost 400,000 uh, UK... Into that a little bit. Exactly. In a practical terms, how will these pensioners be affected? Because uh, whilst you can decide that... Uh, you give mutual rights. Pensioners, in order to have uh, their rights, uh, need an overarching uh, structure. So there is lots of secondary legislation. And this legislation allows, for instance, for your pension to be paid abroad, to be indexed uh, as if it, you were here. And uh, crucially, it allows uh, your national health service, uh, oh, you have a right for your national health service to pay your uh, expenses abroad. Um, so whereas uh, maybe it's not so expensive to have a private insurance if you are young and fit, it is incredibly expensive if you are a pensioner. And so once that system is no longer in place, uh, even if you have equality of rights, you might see that these pensioners simply cannot stay abroad. Um, and so I think a special attention should be given to to replacing this coordination. But the problem is this coordination will have to be negotiated with all of the member states once the UK is out. So it's, 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 it's going to take a long time, and that's why they are particularly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Rachel Hamilton, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I'd like to ask Professor Koshinov. Um, you said that the position of the UK was ov overwhelmingly weak, and I wondered if that was because you then later said that the issue of scale and um, the territory of rights of access to, for EU nationals to 27 other member states, was that why you said that the position of the UK is overwhelmingly uh, weak, or can you expand on that? So the, <clears throat> the idea of the index is that, uh, is that nationalities get extra, extra points for access to other states outside of the sovereign territory uh, corresponding to the state granting, uh, granting the status of citizenship. So if, if, if we're speaking about hard Brexit, uh, UK nationals will, will lose rights in 27 states, and possibly more if, if it extends to, to EA nations and, and, 
uh, free movement to, to Norway, uh, and as, as well as EFTA, uh, meaning Switzerland. So we are speaking about, about a drastic reduction of the territory where the rights are guaranteed, including, crucially, non-discrimination on the basis of nationality. So suddenly, the context changes to such, to, to such a degree that it becomes legal and sometimes will become imperative for, for European nations to discriminate on the basis of nationality against the holders of UK passports. So suddenly, this presumption that everybody is on equal footing in Europe will not apply at all unless uh, serious steps are taken in the, in the negotiations to, to ensure that this, uh, this indeed happens. And, and in, in this respect, I would disagree most uh, respectfully with Sander, because I don't think it's, it's up to the UK in terms of giving, giving grace to those, uh, to, the, to those EU citizens to decide what happens with them. It, it, it is bound to become a fundamental issue in the negotiations between the UK and the European Union. This, uh, the issue of free movement is, is essential for, for a large number of European member states, especially Eastern and Central European countries. And, 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 and their leaders already made it quite clear that, that, they, will, that they will put this, uh, this issue on so the that's agenda. A, that's a conflation of two separate issues. The, the, the rights and status of people who live in Britain who happen to be Europeans the day after Britain has left the European Union, the British government can make any decision it wants. The EU governments can make any decisions they wanted. I, I can't see if, you know, we'll come onto it later, if, if the EU27 decided to offer associate citizenship or something, however likely or unlikely that is, I don't see how the British government could refuse it. You're, of course, right that the question of the future of free movement, the future policy of immigration to the UK, the future policy of the EU governments towards immigration, that, that will be an issue of negotiation in which future immigration policy, future market access will be, will be linked. The point matters here about the separation because we do not know the outcome of the immigration discussion, the market access discussion, or anything else. If we were to guarantee the status and rights of the EU nationals already here, um, or who arrive, say, up to Article 50, which is a legal moment when there is a notification that something has happened and Britain is leaving, that guarantee would stand, whether or not we continue free movement, join the EEA, have a transitional arrangement of five or ten years, or have the hardest possible Brexit. And so we're not then asking the people already affected to wait for a two-year period with this anxiety hanging over them to find out what their status is. We are making everybody else around Europe and around Britain wait for two years to find out what future rules apply. I'd like to bring in Professor Barnard, because she's been sitting very patiently there down in Cambridge. So, um, would you like to comment on what you've heard? Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, as far as EU citizenship is concerned, I think there's quite a lot of misunderstanding about some fairly rudimentary points. Um, the first point is that uh, everyone who holds the nationality of a member state uh, is an EU citizen. And so uh, following Brexit, um, those UK nationals will no longer hold the nationality of a member state of the European Union and therefore will no longer be EU citizens. Now, de deprivation of citizenship is um, a serious matter. Um, it's less serious um, legally than it might otherwise be because, of course, UK nationals will retain the nationality of the United Kingdom, so they will not be rendered stateless. But nevertheless, they will be deprived of the rights we've heard about, the rights of free movement. Now, as far as um, those who enjoy the rights of free movement are concerned, if we go back to 1957 when the treaty was first drafted, actually only those who were economically active had the rights of free movement. So only those who were employed, workers, those who were self-employed, and those who provided services. Now... Scrolling forward to the early 1990s, added to that mix were people who were semi-economically active, so students and persons of independent means, which would also include the retired. And those two groups had the rights of free movement, provided they had sufficient resources and sufficient medical insurance. And then, 1992, everyone who held the nationality of a member state became a, an EU citizen. And so then the question was, well, what extra, who else fell under the net to enjoy the rights of free movement? 
And there was a group that had been left out of that analysis I've just given, which are those who really do not are, not, are, are essentially economically inactive. And there was a period of time when it looked like the Court of Justice was going to give quite significant rights to people who were economically uh, inactive, so people who were not contributing to the economy of the host state. Um, but in a major decision um, a couple of years ago, a case called Dano, the Court of Justice really seemed to have clamped down on that. And so it said, basically, you've got to have, as a minimum, sufficient resources and sufficient health insurance to be living um, and in another member state. So those who are on the margins of society, although are citizens, probably don't actually have the rights to free movement. Now, on Brexit, what we will have is that those rights for the groups I've just identified will be removed unless we um, join the European Economic Area as an independent state, not as um, qua a membership of the European Union. Um, now, of course, the advantage of joining the European Economic Area is that it is um, as close to the position as we've got at present. But it's worth noting that the European Economic Area does not recognise the concept of EU citizenship. And so, in fact, if you, we were to rejoin the EEA, the European Economic Area, and thus our position would be much the same as Norway or Iceland then there would be rights of free movement for those who are economically active, so workers, self-employed, service providers. And the so-called Citizens' Rights Directive would also apply, so students and persons of independent means would have rights. But any hope that those who are economically inactive, um, any rights they might have had previously under the more general principles of citizenship, they wouldn't apply. And the EFTA court doesn't um, give a sort of citizenship expansive reading of uh, the rights for those essentially economically active people. So what about, uh, say, a spouse of a, say, a Spanish spouse of a British citizen who's spent her time, say, for example, as a mum bringing up children? What kind of rights would she have, if any? If she's been, always so been economically seems... inactive? Yeah, so that's the interesting question. So um, under EU law, as it stands at present, and under what would be EEA law, um, she would um, have independent rights of free movement if she was a person of independent means, i.e. with sufficient medical insurance and sufficient resources, which might have come from her husband, her British husband. Where there's been a stumbling block at the moment is what constitutes sufficient medical insurance. Do you actually have to have a private policy that, uh, for which you're paying medical insurance, or is it enough you can rely on, at present, the EHIC card? Or is it enough, as at present, that you've got access to the NHS? And this is where it's not clear, and this actually feeds into the broader discussion of what if there is a, um, a hard Brexit, what's going to happen to those um, spouses um, if they want to stay in the UK and they can't show that they have got sufficient medical insurance so they don't benefit from permanent residency. In order to get permanent residence under EU law at the moment, you've got to have done five years under one of the categories I've mentioned, including being a person of independent means, including having medical insurance. Um, and we, you've already heard that there's quite a lot of political will that people who've done five years should be given some sort of equivalent of indefinite leave to remain, um, but only if they can show that they've got medical insurance and they've been here um, for five years. So there's going to be practical problems about proof. But leave to remain, we know from third-party citizens and... Uh, work as MSPs is really quite a complex thing to achieve. And I know that in our, our written briefings there's been talk of a more streamlined version of Leave to Remain, but it is still a really complicated process, isn't it? And, of course, it's also expensive. And the great advantage for migrants um, under EU rules is that the process is cheap, really cheap at the moment, to get a permanent residence card. And that's why um, ILPA, the Immigration Lawyers 
Practitioners Association um, have advocated some sort of status a bit like indefinite leave to remain, but give it a different name so that the individuals aren't caught by the really significant um, fees that are currently charged to third country nationals. Thank you very much. I know that Mr Katwala wants to come in and uh, Professor Kocherov, but I would like to hand over to Lewis MacDonald. Perhaps they might also have views on, 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 on the question of how that is actually applied. So um, if, if we're talking about people who have been resident here for more than five years, that will be a very large part of the three million across the UK, a, a very large part of the population of EU citizens here in Scotland. And some of them will, by definition, have no categorical documentary evidence that they've been here three years, if they've been self-employed, as many tradesmen and, and women, for example, uh, might, might be. And um, also, many of them who have been here for five years, and indeed a lot longer, will never have considered applying for documentary evidence of that for the simple reason that they did not foresee the possibility they would need that. So I'd be very interested in the views of perhaps starting with Mr Kadwala, given his, his report on, on, on the matter and, and, and others, about the practicalities of how that five-year status or how the, the right to remain could be recognised uh, and then how it could be applied free of, free of charge or without the fees. That, uh, that's, um, that's completely right. I mean, if, if we had the decision to grant this status, um, implementing that, I think, would be the biggest administrative task the Home Office had ever carried out in its history. The group that have five years and so have an entitlement to permanent residence now is probably about two-thirds of the three million, about two million people, about, um, therefore about 100,000 people in Scotland. Um, ministers in the UK government um, occasionally talk about that if asked about it as simply a formality. And, you know, it's quite a complicated form and process, but it costs £65 to do it. Um, indefinite leave to remain for a non-EU citizen costs um, uh, £1,800. And seventy-five pounds. So there is a very big uh, gap there. Our proposal is that you know it's very important to do this properly and well, and that people should have the minimum of um, inconvenience, cost, and hassle. We think that the cost of applying for the bespoke status should be capped at the level of a UK citizen applying for a first passport, £72, um, and that that would, you know, that, that would be fair and reasonable. But there's also the problem of the sheer scale of this. The comprehensive health insurance is the biggest barrier. Between a third and 40% of these applications that are supposed to be a formality, really, um, are refused. And in our evidence, this was one of the biggest reasons for refusal. Our proposal is not to refuse on the grounds of um, the requirement of comprehensive health insurance, especially from the old EU, um, the initial EU countries. People were never aware that this requirement was brought in and changed if they'd been a student. So simply not requiring that would, would make a big difference. Or um, ILPA's um, suggestion has been treat the legal use, right to use the NHS as meeting the requirement. But if, if you took away the complex health insurance, that would work um, uh, as well. The other issue is um, how can we make this more practical? And there are um, uh, local nationality checking services um, around the UK, um, about 120 of them, six in Scotland. And that means in terms of getting your documentation and so on, you know, you can go in, they can check whether you've got the right things, you can go home and get it. You're not sent in a pile that isn't open for six months and then you find you haven't got something. So... I read that in your mm. written evidence. That's a huge burden on the local authorities who administer So they, they, can, they can charge. So if they were allowed to charge, say, the £70 to, to do this, and if the simple cases go in, they also have access to HMRC uh, and to other DWP data and documentation that the state holds. So what, what is possible here is that they could green light simple cases, but not refuse cases. So if they cannot green light it, it can go into the Home Office pile, but we could get the Home Office pile down to the, you know, down to the hundreds of thousands, not the three million, because we've got, you know, two million cases of people with five years um, residence, another several hundred thousand who will have five years by Brexit day, and we could let people do this nearer their homes. But, the, you know, the local authorities should be able to keep the cost of providing this 
service. But, you know, the other burden that will come in is not just people trying to find out, you know, their gas bill from five years ago, etc. But as an employer, you'd be looking not just to your current employees, but everybody you might have employed since 2004 might suddenly be coming back looking for the evidence. You might have gone out of business. So where we can use the state systems to prove that people have a footprint, everybody exercising their free movement rights will have a footprint in systems that the government holds. We should try to access those systems to give people their status in the simple cases. A lot of work. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Spaventa, I think you wanted to come in. Uh, yes, and I think, I mean, it's bizarre that uh, uh, European students have never been told about the comprehensive health insurance requirement. And so now we have the situation that uh, third country nationals who pay £150 per year of a health surcharge are in a much, potentially much better position than EU citizens. And this uh, thing, uh, it is true that the Home Office uh, um, accepts the European Health Insurance Card. The problem is that your state of origin only uh, gives you that until when you are resident there. And so whilst an undergraduate student, students might have that because they are still resident at home, graduate students, PhD students, those people who have settled in the UK for, you know, with families and, and so on, they wouldn't have that. And, and we know from uh, Durham that that is a real problem. We have graduate students who have been there for a long time and yet don't manage to fulfill the criteria. And uh, the other problem is obviously the fee, but the fee applies for every single family member. So if you're a family of five, multiply 1,875 pounds per five, that's a lot of money um, to ask uh, uh, low-skilled workers, and we know that there are lots of low-skilled workers, and, and, and they came in good faith when it was a right to come here. So we must be very, very careful that these rules are not, uh, don't turn out to be incredibly punitive. And the last problem I would like to highlight that we haven't touched upon is a third country national family members of union citizens. Because those people, um, especially if there has been a divorce or there has been a death in the family so that the main right holder, say the Italian spouse, who is here as departed or as divorced, then uh, you might have a US uh, citizen or a, a Somali citizen who had a right to stay here up until Brexit and with her children possibly and loses everything afterwards because they are no longer going to be protected. And the particular risk is that negotiations uh, or mutual agreements will focus on union citizens and will forget that the union citizens might have family members who came uh, legitimately and with an expectation of being treated in a certain way. And again, to, re to, to push them uh, towards a normal immigration status, because it is uh, so expensive in the UK to be an immigrant, uh, it's possibly not fair. And also, you have a uh, if they were to become normal immigrants, they would have to fulfill the income requirement. And again, this is not obvious that they would, uh, they would manage to do that. So I think... What's the alternative for somebody in that position? What's the alternative way for government to deal with that case? That, uh, I think that uh, whatever framework we put has to include a third country national family members so that uh, currently they are treated as if they were uh, almost union citizens. Uh, and they have to be included explicitly so that if you can prove a family tie or that you had matured a right under uh, the citizenship directive, which is uh, you had been married three years of which one in the UK or you are a widower and so on, uh, or there are domestic violence issues or you are a child because there are chi children involved as well, then you should get exactly the same rights. And uh, again, it's very important because in EU law, <coughs> if you are a British child or oh, a child of a worker, of a, say, a child of an Italian worker, and your mom is American, and uh, your worker uh, goes away or dies or divorces you or is uh, an abusive partner, the child in education also keeps the rights. And this means that the mother or father, the, the person who is caring for that child, also has a right to reside. And this is not the same in British immigration 
law. So again, there, is a, there are lots of bits that need to be considered. Bribe could be accommodated in the sort of thing that Mr. Katwala was proposing. Yes, I think and so. And would not require uh, agreement with the EU. It could be done unilaterally. It could by be the done, UK and I think yeah. we have to remember that uh, not to talk only about union citizens, but also the third country yeah. national family members, because they have also come here in the ex exercising rights, basically. Uh, Professor Cacciano. In, and in this sense, I, I think it makes sense to say that these derived rights of family members of, of EU citizens used to be derived rights of family members of EU workers before 1982, before the creation of citizenship, just to add to what Professor Barnard has described. So the framework from the very beginning, from the 50s in the EU, the framework of free movement, obviously included uh, more vulnerable individuals who were not economically active as long as they were attached, as it were, uh, their rights were secondary and derived from the rights of EU citizens. So in, uh, these, these people definitely should be protected in the UK after Brexit as well. In a way, we should realize that the EEA framework, if, if the UK opts for that, in part will protect those people because, uh, because uh, the EEA applies, uh, applies to all the, all the persons moving freely as if 1992 Maastricht Treaty didn't happen. So, in fact, the EA court is obliged to interpret the directive on, on uh, citizens' free movement, including the rights that it grants to, uh, to family members who are not economically active, in such a way uh, as, as if citizenship was not created by the Treaty of Maastricht. And this, all, this covers all the family members of, of those who are economically active themselves. And in this sense, Il ILPA's proposals are, are actually great, and they would they, they would add uh, a great deal to the to the EA framework if that one is chosen. But then on, on, on a different point, if the UK really starts checking this health care, health insurance requirement uh, after, after leaving the UK, it looks like a new condition introduced uh, randomly and applied retroactively uh, compared with the conditions that the EU citizens had to satisfy uh, the, throughout the time of, EU mem of uh, UK's EU membership. Uh, because I think the, 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 the cut-off idea of how you satisfy the conditions for permanent residence should be precisely as, as, as you said, Mr. MacDonald, uh, the practice uh, as applied during, during the, the full membership of the UK and the EU. So if in practice, uh, uh, health care condition was not checked, say, 10 years ago, when permanent residence cards were issued to EU citizens, this practice should, uh, sh should remain as, as a valid reference point. Because otherwise, if we suddenly start interpreting EU free movement framework uh, as if uh, it, it, it required the EU, EU, EU free movers uh, to, to provide some proof of, of, uh, of health insurance, we're clearly adding a new requirement. And this is something that, 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 that unfortunately is omnipresent in the UK debate. It's a, the, the, there, is, the, the, there is no realization at all in the debate that this new requirement is sold to us as something, as something that is classically present. This is not the case. I know that Brendan Donnelly would like to come in. Yes, but very briefly to say, if I may, that um, I think the last point about adding an extra duty, an extra responsibility, um, illuminates an important part of the overall negotiations which are taking place, it seems to me, at a number of levels. One between the United Kingdom and the EU, one between the Prime Minister and her party, and one between the Prime Minister and those people who voted to leave. And for many of those people who voted for leave, the idea that something is very different and more onerous is precisely what they were voting for. So there will always be this tension between continuity on the one hand, which uh, I can see grounds of equity and goodwill might well point in one direction, but the need to demonstrate um, from the Prime Minister and other ministers that Brexit means Brexit <laughs> and that is something very different from the position up till now will also be a, for her and for her, her ministers a, a, an important categorical imperative. Uh, there is a very clear distinction to be drawn from a legitimate future debate about political and policy choices in the future and retrospective changes to people here. There is very clearly a public consensus that over three quarters of Leave voters, as well as 90% of Remain voters, 84% of people in fact think that the right to remain and settle of people already here should be upheld. And there are no voices in the political 
debate opposing that so we could act on that. The health insurance requirement was changed in 2004, and what we've found is that if you are A8 or A2, you know about it because the requirements were introduced at a time when you were coming in. And if you are... If you are um, EU15 then, or EU14, then you, you don't know about it. Nobody told you at all there was a change in 2004, and so it feels like a new requirement you weren't told about. And finding a way to waive that deals with a lot of the administrative problem. Yeah, I'm keen to bring in Jackson Carlo. I'd actually like to return to um, Mr Donnelly. Um, I mean, we've now, from our professorial academic and uh, think tank advisors had quite an intense exchange. Uh, in fact, at times I, I wondered if we needed to be here. It was getting a very kind of direct between them. But I, I note obviously that in your own career you have worked in the Foreign Office, the European Parliament and the European Commission. And I'm interested as you listened to that exchange, uh, with that experience, how these various dynamics do you feel will be being assessed and taken into account uh, just now, it, it, I mean, it, it, that intensity and the contradictions that arose within it, how will they be being currently assessed, even in the kind of slight vacuum you identified at the start of our not knowing entirely, other than that we want to leave, what the, the position going forward will be beyond that? This would be how they're assessed by our partners, our EU partners. Well, and also within the, 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 the foreign office here and the, 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 the both, both aspects of it, because, you know, that was... I mean, I'm struck by how intense the kind of and complicated some of that will be. And yet I was watching you throughout it and you had that rather phlegmatic appearance of, of, of a diplomat almost who was listening to all that with a kind of bemused detachment, uh, thinking, well, I can see all that, but there will be people thinking a way through that. Is, is that your view? Well, I, I, I must adopt a better poker face in future, I think, <laughs> if, if it's so easy to read at least a part of my thought. I, I mean, I, I, I absolutely welcome, uh, on grounds of equity, the discussions which are, have gone on. Um, but I do have the sense that, that it's the overarching political um, question that will be decisive in these matters, um, even to quite a, a micro level. Um, and I did mention part of the, um, uh, the, the public perception that Mrs May and her ministers want to create. Um, but I, I think I, I'd go further, that um, I don't think that for our uh, partners, um, this debate is at the heart of what they're interested in. I agree entirely that, a, that a, 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 gen, a generous gesture towards the two million would be very, very welcome and would help our negotiating position. I do agree with that. Um, but I think that, that there is um, a fundamental problem at the beginning, which is that uh, uh, those, th this country, those people who are, as it were, running Brexit, um, believe that we can have a better um, uh, adjustment of rights and responsibilities than we have at the moment. It's the specific and stated aim of our partners to give us a worse deal. How can those two be brought together? And it seems to me that they can only be brought together by something rather like where we are at the moment, which undermines entirely the proposition that Brexit will, will bring something useful about. Um, and I'm not sure how that's going to be squared. So I'm not sure a diplomat could tell you how to do that. Um, a diplomat certainly will look at the, the issues, the important issues that have been raised. Um, but the, the diplomat in the Foreign Office, it seems to me, um, has no more idea how that circuit is to be squared than, than I do, or if, with respect, I, I suspect you do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Barnard, did you want to come in there? No, no I, actually, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. The, the, the fundamental issue is um, what to do with those people who are already here and the, then going forward the future relationship. Now, my, my understanding from what I've seen from the political debate is that even amongst the most ardent leavers among the politicians, that they are very willing to give uh, recognition um, of rights to those EEA nationals who are already here. And that could be dealt with through some of the proposals that British Futures and others have put forward. I think the, the, the circle will be squared somewhat in respect of what the situation will look like going forward in respect of new migrants. And then the question is, do we join the EEA um, and um, have essentially migration 
on much the same terms um, with uh, those who are economically active plus students plus those with independent means? Or do we have a much more dramatic curtailment of immigration? Now, what's interesting about the EEA agreement is that it does have an emergency break provision in it, in Article, I think, 112, um, which the EU treaty does not have. Now, there's been no experience of using the um, emergency break provision in the EEA agreement, but it is there in the case of um, a significant need by a member state that wants to interfere with the operation of, for example, free movement. But it may be that that is just too sensitive because the political downsides of um, rejoining the EEA, EEA are great, namely that um, we will be bound by EU rules um, over which we will not have a formal say, although we will have a say um, in respect of their drafting at an early stage, they get, the EEA states get consulted there. Um, and also, of course, we will have to continue paying into the EU budget. And uh, Norway is the 10th largest contributor to the EU budget at present. And these things may just be too politically unpalatable. So then the question is, should there be a, a bespoke deal going forward, which may be sector specific? So recognising, for example, that there is a need in the care sector or possibly in the agricultural sector for the introduction of, in the case of the agricultural sector, some sort of um, uh, seasonal workers agreement as an arrangement as they used to be. And the government works on a bilateral uh, ba or a basis of having a specific deal, but se sector specific rather than a general right of free movement. But that's going forward, not dealing with those who are already um, in this country. If I could move the, 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 the um, discussion on to talk about the rights of uh, UK citizens, I, I wondered if the members of the panel would care to comment on the proposal by Guy Verhofstadt on the idea of buying into associate membership uh, of the EU, and whether the Professor Kachenov. Well, unfortunately, under the current conditions, I don't see any any possibility, legally speaking, to have this in place. It, it's it's absolutely indispensable to change the treaty in this respect, because uh, because Part Two TFEU, which is responsible for citizenship, doesn't allow for this kind of status. So, if if all the member states of the EU agree, and if it's seen as as politically palatable for them then this is something we can speak about. But there is a fundamental problem here, because uh, once, once we speak about post-Brexit relations between the UK and the EU, this, uh, these are most likely reciprocity-based relations. So if we speak about an associate citizenship, this is a one-way one way pro provision of rights, as opposed to a reciprocal arrangement, because, because all EU citizens uh, who didn't lose the status as a result of Brexit, but find themselves in the UK for one reason or another, will not benefit at all from, from this kind of grant of rights to those who actually exercise their full political sovereignty to leave the EU in the first place. So, uh, so there are several problems with this associate citizenship uh, idea. The first one, uh, the EU is asked to grant rights to those who decided precisely to leave the EU. And second, the EU thereby doesn't grant any rights whatsoever to its own citizens. So it, it might even be uh, contrary to the idea of non-discrimination as understood in EU law as such. And, and, and for this reason, I don't think it's, it's something that, that, that can possibly go through. Uh, my understanding was that it was individuals that he was suggesting might want to buy in, but Professor Spaventa? I agree that you need to change the treaty and uh, Let's remember that the Eastern Bloc is not impressed by the political rhetoric of not wanting uh, um, EU workers because, for, for obvious reasons, of, uh, of migration post-2004. So there might be a political unwillingness to do it. I disagree with, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Kochenov on the fact that it might conflict with uh, uh, principles in the treaty, but you would need a treaty uh, modification. And also, this will open up a new, uh, another debate, an historical debate, which has been long standing since 1992, which is the need for <coughs> EU to give uh, some sort of union citizenship to third country nationals who are residing in the EU territory. And uh, you might say that is not 
connected, but it will be politically connected. And so it's not just the decision of, yes, I treat the UK citizens better, because then there will be a legitimate claim by third country nationals who have been in the EU territory for more than 10 years to have a similar treatment. So I think it's wonderful. I think it, in, in theory, but in practice, it has been misrepresented by the media also as an idea that, uh, you know, the European Parliament would make it a condition for, for any deal, which is actually not true. I think the <laughs> I think Brendan Donnelly wanted yeah. to bring well, very briefly to tell, I think for some of our partners, it, it is a proposal that would have some attractions, actually, because um, it's not the people who voted for Brexit who are going to be applying for associate European citizenship, it seems to me. It's precisely the, the downtrodden minority in the view of certain of our, of our continental colleagues. So I think this is something that, that, that might well uh, fly and, and be an interesting element of the negotiations. I'd like all our witnesses to comment on this, so I'll go to Mr. Karwala and then uh, Professor Barnard. I think the proposal is a symbolic political gesture at this stage, and politicians make symbolic political gestures. That's part of politics. I think, I think it does risk raising expectations, perhaps particularly in Scotland or in London or the more strongly EU... Uh, uh, pro-EU parts of the country that this will happen or the European Parliament has a uh, way to do it. There's a catch-22 in this, I think. I think the EU27 governments are very unlikely to offer it, you know, apart from the fact of needing a treaty to, to do so. The UK government could be entirely indifferent about the symbolic gesture and say, please offer it if you'd like to. They could take offence at it for symbolic reasons as well, but they could just say, I'm very happy for our citizens to be offered things on an optional basis. I think the catch-22 is it would only make sense to offer it to individual citizens if free movement was in place, at which point um, the content of the offer would be diminished. But the idea of EU27 governments offering the chance for a million, two million, five million Britons who might like to live and work abroad to opt in unilaterally to one-way free movement would be a very curious thing for them to do at the start of a negotiation. Professor Barnard? Yes, I, I rather agree with that analysis. Um, I think uh, for Remainers, of course, it has raised uh, hopes that there is uh, that people... Um, on the other side of the channel are listening to their position. I think some Remainers feel that um, the, the Leave campaign has been very successful in um, really running the show at the moment. Um, and so this at least showed a recognition that there were quite a lot of people who did not vote in favour of Brexit. Um, on the other hand, um, so much is um, left unsaid, in particular um, how much payment would there need to be on an annual basis to enjoy this associate citizenship? Um, would it be £100 or £1,000? But if you think if it is accompanied with the rights to have access to the benefit system in another member state or access to the healthcare system in another member state in the case of emergency treatment, assuming that uh, the EHIC card disappears, then um, it starts to become quite costly for those other member states. And so uh, there may be quite strong uh, political uh, imperative on the part of the EU27 to say, no way, because it is not reciprocated. That said, it is worth bearing in mind, and it may be at the root of why so many people did vote leave, is that although all the benefits at present under EU law are reciprocal, so if um, I go to France and get sick, I get treated in a French hospital, and likewise vice versa with a French person in the UK, in fact, migration has not been um, evenly spread across the uh, EU for very obvious reasons that we know about. Um, if you look, for example, at uh, universities, um, there's been quite a significant influx of EU migrants, often to the benefit of British universities, but not the same numbers are going to, for example, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, um, as Poles are coming to the UK. And so there is a perception of the uneven um, burden uh, and spread of migration across the European Union. Associate citizenship, of course, would mean that um, there is this in reverse, that um, large numbers of UK nationals would be able to take advantage of it were it to be adopted. Bring in Stuart McMillan, MSP. Uh, thank you. Um, I found this area uh, to be uh, fascinating, to be honest. Uh, I was going to come to uh, Mr Donnelly, first of all, but you actually uh, preempted uh, the question. But, but certainly Mr Kitwala's uh, point regarding the Catch-22... 
uh, situation in this uh, associate membership. Now, if, uh, if, it were, if there were to be proposals put on the table uh, regarding the associate membership, uh, and the, clearly there would be uh, benefits for uh, UK nationals, but certainly um, I could foresee benefits also for the other 27 member states. There's certainly evidence that this committee has received in the past regarding uh, well, the financial uh, sector and also in terms of academia and researchers. Uh, when the UK does come out uh, of the, the European Union, uh, there has been the, the issues raised in terms of uh, trying to entice uh, industry, entice uh, workers from the UK to go and relocate uh, elsewhere in the European Union. So in terms of the associate membership, is that something they think would actually make that uh, easier uh, to undertake? or uh, would it be something that wouldn't have much of an impact at all? In a way, it's, a, it's another way of restating the sort of catch-22 issue. I mean, I think this, this proposal has an impact if there is a very distant and cold Brexit, whereas Britain as to the European Union is as, you know, is as the UK to anywhere else in the world, South Korea or Japan, and it has less impact the closer the partnership after the EU you have, and yet the political willingness to do it, I think, would be high if there was a very close partnership, and, and very low, I think, if there'd been a you know, total breakdown of relationships. At that point, it would become rather a one-way offer for people to, to um, opt in. I mean, one of the features of um, UK attitudes that might change after the referendum, but including in Scotland as across the UK, is that, is that the... Um, the level of identification as European, national as European, is just distinctly lower in the UK than in all the other EU member states. And in the, in the NATSEN evidence, it was running at a level of about 15% of people <coughs> choosing it among all their other identities. It might be that the people who voted Remain feel much more European after June and in the, in the future. So the, the take-up wouldn't... The symbolism of it might not be as effective as well as some of the people, uh, you know, think it, think it might be. I think this... Um, this identity issue affects, in many ways, why free movement uh, is a different debate in Britain from the rest of the EU, which is a big issue in these negotiations. Because I think if you have, if you have an idea of national citizenship and European citizenship and European identity, which is basically the norm in the other countries, then EU free movement is a hybrid, in a way, of migration and of internal mobility. And I think in the UK, free movement looks much more like a form of immigration than it does like a form of inward mobility because the level of European identity and European, the salience of European citizenship has been very low in the past ahead of this referendum. Mr Donnelly. If, if I may, um, just to confirm um, something that we've just said about uh, European identity. I remember at um, the time of the, the European Constitutional Treaty talking with German friends uh, about the reassurance that they believed that many German citizens derived from a European level of defence of their rights. Um, I, don't, I think there are many fewer people in this country who perceive what is the, 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 the basis of, of a lot of your questioning, European rights. Um, they think rights should come in many cases, from the United Kingdom. Um, and insofar as rights come from, the uni from, from a united Europe, they may be in conflict with the rights of um, uh, British citizens as decided by Parliament. And that is a, a, a debate that's much more salient in this country than it is in most continental countries. Well, what might the position of Scotland be in this context, uh, given that Scotland uh, voted 62% remain and the First Minister has said that she's looking for some kind of differentiated, we think, and some kind of differentiated deal for, for Scotland. I mean, would it be possible for Scotland to have associate rights as somewhere which voted remain? These, sorry. Yeah, Professor Spaventa. Was Catherine coming in? Sorry. Yes. Um, but it depends what the associated membership means. If you have free movement, I mean, either you interpret this as a really symbolic gesture whereby you simply remove the need of a visa to travel to the EU, 
then, of course. But uh, if you mean it as a, a proper substantial status where you have a free movement of workers, where you have the right to work and engage in the economic life of another member state, you again have the problem of reciprocity and it's difficult to understand how you would carve out this deal just for the Scottish people. Um, and also, you know, if even... I mean, if you give any right to exercise an economic activity, you cannot really say you can exercise self-employment but not employment, say that workers were our particular concern, because what you risk then is bogus self-employment, which is a disaster for the working standards of the countries that are affected, and we have evidence. So I don't see how we could, even if we wanted, uh, how that could uh, legally or politically being carved so as to have any significance beyond, you know, coming in and out. In, in London, there's quite a lot of work being done on a, a visa for, for London. And the evidence that this committee took last week was that we have the similar issues to London in terms of skilled workforce, but we also have this additional demographic challenge in that Without more migration, uh, Scotland uh, has big, big demographic challenges, much more so than the rest of the UK. And there have been acknowledgements of that by, say, the UK government. There have been uh, yeah, noises in the sense that they understand that that's a, an issue for Scotland. So... Scottish visa, London visa, then how do you control that that person doesn't move somewhere else? <laughs> and Italy is a funny country because we had visas from the south of Italy to work in the north, even after we were members of the European communities. This is because the northerners didn't like the southerners. Um, but uh, the, it's impossible to, uh, how do you enforce that? So if I come here as an Italian to Scotland, uh, how can you make sure I don't end up in Durham? Um, and it's okay if I'm employed because you are, enforce, you are imposing on my employer uh, a visa check. But what if I say that I'm self-employed? How are you going to police that? It's very difficult. Um, to have something like that, and also how do you reconcile that with uh, the basic idea that you should be able to move around your own state, a state without checks? So I don't think it's so easy. Mr. Kawar. The, the international evidence, and you know, there are regional systems, often in larger geographical territories, is, is very mixed on this precise question of control. In the UK context after Brexit, um, UK confidence of the public in the government having an immigration system that works or it manages is, is very, very low compared to confidence elsewhere. And so until you've got that confidence in a system, um, people would struggle with, um, the, you know, what, what the international evidence shows is that people will very easily move, of course, um, from the area they have rights to. There are, I think, exceptions, and you had the, the fresh talent and post-study um, system in the past, and the attraction of a system like that is, as a graduate from a Scottish university, having therefore some ties in Scotland, with an offer of a job from a Scottish employer um, for a limited period of time, say two or three years, we, we could then make your, your future eligibility for other forms of visas or settlement dependent on you having been seen to do it. We might then have a system where we could, where we could win trust and assurance that it seems rather likely that people offered this will play by the rules and not go and work somewhere they're not meant to. But I think you, you've got, I mean, the UK government, I think, is very sceptical because it likes to, you know, keep the powers to itself of regional schemes. But I think you have a problem of political and public consent until you can show why something would be enforceable that's very hard to enforce. Professor Barnard? Yeah, I, uh, on, on this point about um, employers having to do enforcement, um, it's, com it's a common misunderstanding um, that immigration is all about border control uh, and thus controlling numbers is done at the border. This is absolutely not the case. Border control is for keeping, largely for keeping out undesirable people. It's not about controlling immigration. The immigration control is being done now much more by employers. 
And here, if I can declare an interest wearing my employer hat, because I am um, senior tutor of the uh, largest college um, at Cambridge, <clears throat> the uh, implications for now having to have uh, visas for any EEA nationals working in the UK is significant. The burdens of administering Tier 2 and Tier 4 visas are really quite substantial. Uh, it's highly complex. It's also very, very expensive for the individuals concerned. And the prospect of having to do much more of that for all of the EEA nationals um, is really quite concerning. And this is not a, a, a uniquely Cambridge point. It applies to any employer who employs um, uh, non-British nationals because the enforcement is done by employers. It's not done by border guards. There's a common misunderstanding on that point. Secondly, it is just worth bearing in mind that um, although um, we know that a lot of people were voted, motivated to vote Leave because of their concerns about um, EU immigration, in fact, immigration coming from third countries, i.e. non-EEA states, is still higher than it is coming from EU states. And in respect of third states, i.e. non-EEA states, we still have complete control, and yet the numbers are still higher. It's not significant. It's about, um, last year it was about 270,000 coming from um, EU states and about 285,000 coming from third countries. But the fact is um, we do have now complete control in respect of those third countries. Mr Donnelly? Um, uh, I agree that the cases of Scotland and Ireland in some ways are similar in regard to possible separate visa regimes. I agree with Professor Spaventa, and, and I think I'd just add uh, one thing, which is that, that, that traditionally, or for a long time, the British labour market has been a, a highly deregulated one. That makes it, in my view, rather more difficult to police within a geographic area of Spain or, or London the visas, um, because it's very easy to set yourself up as self-employed. And I'm not sure that all um, employers will be as scrupulous as the University of Cambridge in checking the obligations regarding Scottish or, or London visa holders for, from, from the European Union. Of course, Scotland's getting full powers over income tax now. Sorry. As, as of this year, Scotland will have full powers over income tax. So there'll be a Scottish rate of income tax. Do you think that'll make a difference? Um, I think it would need to be very different from what it is now for it to be a significant factor. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that people come from continental Europe, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, as we, we regard it, um, on the basis of, of, of very much uh, higher um, salaries um, in this country, which, which will not greatly be changed by, by changes in the income tax unless they were so radical. The reason I say that is, is, is because you can actually identify where the, the person lives because they're um, paying that rate of income tax. The, the residency yes, but has people, to be determined. Yes, but then people from Scotland will, will be able to go easily to England. And my, my thought is that perhaps English employers and English authorities wouldn't be as, um, uh, as, as stringent as, as might be the case in Scotland. Right. <coughs> Professor Kachenov. I just want to throw in uh, a basic idea, which is which is sometimes forgotten, that the EU is actually extremely flexible in the way how it extends rights to its own citizens outside of its own territory, because the EU territory doesn't overlap entirely with the territories of the member states. So we have plenty of examples in New Caledonia, in French Polynesia, in, 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 the, in the Dutch overseas in the Caribbean, where EU citizens would only have self-employment rights, for instance, and no unlimited right to stay, to stay otherwise, where EU workers will need to apply for a, res, for a residence permit, etc. So, and then the same applies to Greenland, then the, the, there's, there's a very special status for Faroe Islands, Gibraltar, and, I mean, and also the UK participates in this. So if, if we draw examples from there, from the overseas, where the, the boundaries between full members and, and the associate membership are quite blurred, we see that the EU is actually ready uh, to, 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 to go an extra mile to, to meet the requirements of those, of those territories which, which, which are rooted in their special, special nature, in the special nature of their status or their, or their geographical economic, economic position. So in this sense, there is a lot of non-reciprocal relationships 
uh, that, uh, that apply to EU citizens in, in particular territories outside of the EU. And something of this, something of this kind could theoretically inspire negotiations, and, then, uh, and it will be an uncharted territory in many respects, but negotiations that could result in some special relationship between the EU and Scotland or the EU and, say, Northern Ireland. And I know there are some studies on this. For instance, there is, uh, uh, the, there is Dr. Nikos Skutaris at the LSC uh, who, who wrote a detailed paper looking at potential points of inspiration uh, coming from the application of EU law in the overseas in terms of creating flexible mm -hmm. relationships between the EU and, and different, re different regions of the UK. The trouble is, of course, uh, that the, the majority of those countries or territories overseas that got in a symmetrical relationship benefit from, from the goodwill of the, of the EU uh, to contribute to their well-being and to their development. So if, if the country is not as developed as the EU, it can be entitled to some extra border controls, to some special rules that would limit the EU citizens' involvement in the local labor market, and at the same time will give the, the, the residents of that territory full rights in the EU. But then you need to, you need to prove that Scotland is in some sense uh, so special that, that it should convince the EU to, uh, to, to apply the same, the same deviations from its, uh, from its own idea of equality. Saying it's a matter for negotiation. Yeah, so in, in theory, it's, it's possible if, 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 if you really design this, legally speaking, in a, in, in, in a very sound way, to ask for some kind of a really special treatment for certain regions, and the inspiration can come from the overseas. Right. Ross Creer? Yeah, uh, this question is a bit more political speculation than legal theory, I'm afraid. Um, but a lot of the discussions we've had so far do seem to come back to what the political position of the other the U27 will be in regards to, to the UK. And we've touched on the breakdown in goodwill so far. Um, certainly colleagues in, in Brussels and Berlin had mentioned that they realised their side, such as it is, was going to be playing hardball when uh, Angela Merkel dismissed Theresa May's attempts to try and resolve some of these citizenship issues early. I was wondering if you would care to speculate on the what effect next year's elections across the member states might have on the 27's collective negotiating position. I realise it's, it's largely Western European nations, but it is the, the big ones, it is France, Germany, and to a lesser extent the Netherlands. Do you think that will significantly affect it? Because we've seen already it began to creep into the French primary uh, debates. If I may start, the, the fundamental principles will not change. No matter what kind of government is in charge, no, govern, no, no government will, be, will, easily, uh, ad, ad, will easily accept the idea of uh, diminishing the amount of rights that its own citizens enjoy somewhere, which means that I don't see any, any kind of connection, correlation between, between the, the change in government and, and, the, and the idea of protecting the rights of EU citizens uh, post-Brexit in the UK in the context of, uh, of the negotiations. Plus, the institutions, most likely the institutions of the EU, will, will definitely play a significant role. And those are much less affected by political change in, in particular member states. Uh, I think um, we've got perhaps uh, a six a 12-month period or six-month period after Article 50, where I think if we want to check the polarisation of the British debate and the European debate, I think some things have to happen in the UK, where both sides, I think the UK side and the EU side, have talked about their red lines, but neither side has talked very much about solutions that might fit within them. I don't think, because of the reason you give of the elections, we can expect um, European governments to say anything very different until after the German elections, and either the French or, more likely, perhaps the Dutch election might be another very significant sort of disruptive shock. And, you know, people are also still watching how the UK debate plays out around, you know, Article 50 and, you know, are you sure you're leaving? So I think, you know, we won't know what the EU governments actually think in the last six to 12 months of the negotiations because we don't know who the people are in those negotiations, who is the president of France and what is the prevailing political situation. So you have a period of time, I think, between the run-up to Article 50 and Article 50 and the autumn of 2017, when we'll either change or not change 
the UK debate. And if we hear UK voices saying, you know, there is an appetite here for um, a constructive future partnership that we want to negotiate, and here are some ideas of what it looks like, you might get a reciprocity of that spirit. But at the moment, two sets of debates about incompatible red lines mean that whether you want one or not, you're heading to a harder, colder Brexit. Did you want to come in specifically on that point? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in for one second. The, what, the, the building on what Catherine Barnard has already said, uh, migration flows in the EU are, are very, very asymmetrical. So the, the challenges that the UK is facing in the negotiations are very different from what France or the Netherlands will be facing because the UK needs to protect its own citizens in Europe and also think about those EU citizens who are present in the UK. This will not be the case, uh, say, in France or Poland because there are almost no UK citizens in Poland. So there is only one concern for the Polish government and that concern is the protection of Poles in the UK. Which, which definitely will, will affect the way how negotiations unroll. But you could read that differently. The Polish Prime Minister came to London and said very clearly, neither, neither group, the Poles in Britain and the other Europeans in Britain, nor the Britons in Poland, want to feel like hostages to this negotiation. So the Polish government is a strong ally of the UK government getting the agreement from all of the governments because they tend to benefit most from the UK government moving its position. So I continue to think that if we can separate the moral force of the legitimate expectations of the people already experiencing the anxiety from these complex future political negotiations, we could get somewhere. I think it would only be in, in the event of um, Mrs. Le Pen winning the French presidential election that, it would that these elections would make a significant difference. Um, I think that, that there is a, uh, a desire in this country to believe that, as it were, the cards are going to fall in the British government's direction. They're not falling at the moment. Oh, well, there's going to be an election. Perhaps that'll change. Perhaps it'll change in Germany. I, I don't think it will. And I agree very much that, um, that the underlying principles will be the same. I, I think it's quite important in the context of short-term timetables to differentiate between the Article 50 negotiations uh, and the long-term relationship. Um, I think it's possible that the, the lack of a German government probably until December, because even if we have the election in September, it might well be a little while before the government is in place, might make marginally more difficult the, the Article 50 negotiations. But the long-term relationship is, it seems to me, not one that is going to be decided in the next couple of years anyway. So elections make even less of a difference in that context, I'd say about the relationship getting better. I was more concerned about how it might get worse under various post-election <laughs> scenarios. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's much optimism going around here at the moment. Well, I, I think that in London, perhaps, uh, perhaps there's more realism in Scotland. Um, but, but in London, uh, there is the view sometimes that, uh, uh, of course, for domestic audiences, um, French politicians and German politicians have to talk tough about Britain, but they'll change their mind when they're safely re-elected. I, I, I don't believe that. OK. Professor Spaventa? I wanted to, you know, reading some of the European media, there is really no appetite to be nasty to the UK, EU, uh, UK citizens abroad. In fact, it's not covered at all. I think it's given for granted. And remember that most member states have written constitutions with their, uh, fundamental rights enshrined. Uh, in Italy, uh, you know, this is because it's the only legal system beside this one that I know quite well. It, migrants would probably be protected anyway under doctrines of uh, fundamental rights and legitimate expectations. So this idea that the EU is going to use this as a, as a card, I think is very, it's politically very unlikely to happen. Legally, I think they would not be able to, because I think these citizens are still protected under EU law, and they would be protected by the constitutions and you know, the judicial system of those member states. So I'm not very anxious. Beside the pensioners, which are a different problem because you need some cooperation. I, I, I don't know whether Dimitri agrees, but... I'm keen to move on because we have another question from Lewis MacDonald. Yes, it was perhaps um, for uh, Catherine Barnard in the first instance, is really around the, whether there are implications of the ECHR uh, and particularly Article 8, the right to family, privacy of, and, and family life. 
or whether that has any implications for the position either of EU citizens in the UK or vice versa, uh, and whether that in itself might be an influence on the approach to negotiations either by the UK or by the European Commission. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Article 8 certainly will help um, both EU nationals here and UK nationals elsewhere. And of course, in uh, most other member states, as um, Professor Spaventer has said, it's not just the ECHR, but it's also national constitutions which have a fairly robust fundamental rights protection, sometimes better than that provided by the European Convention. Now, in the UK, of course, uh, we've still got the Human Rights Act, uh, which will give effect to Article 8, although the protection there is not always as robust um, as uh, people might think. It's stronger in respect of deportation than it is uh, in respect of uh, family reunification. Um, but certainly it will give some it will give some rights and it will mean that even if there is um, the worst case scenario, which I think we would all agree, which is that, um, that two years expires and there's no deal at all. And therefore we have a disorderly Brexit rather than not just a hard Brexit, but a chaotic Brexit because the time has run out and Article 50 hasn't been the period has not been extended because that requires unanimous voting. The fact is that still the Human Rights Act will apply and also um, common law doctrines based on uh, legitimate expectations, public law doctrines based on legitimate expectations. And so were there suddenly to be a desire to deport all of those uh, EU nationals living in the UK, then the courts would be swamped with challenges based on the ECHR and traditional British public law doctrines. Professor Kochinov is nodding there. Well, I, I fully agree. Um, ECHR will play a decisive role in, in protecting the, those who would otherwise uh, be left without any protection should disorderly Brexit happen. So I, I agree entirely. Article 8 will play a fundamental role there. There's also an important point here, though, that you know, this is a shocking scenario. And I think, as Professor Spaventi um, said, you know, there's a legal backstop here. But the backstop is very much a second or third best approach here. This will be a very slow, a very costly, a very uncertain way of finding out that some people have Article 8 protections and other people don't. So while while that would make you know a shocking scenario of mass deportation something that could be successfully legally challenged, you know, in over two years' time if somebody started trying to do that, um, we've got four million people here who would like to hear something before we settle all of these questions. And that's where I think the civic pressure should be. Now, it's in nobody's interest to end up with a large, irregular group of people who could have had their rights protected. I think where the Scottish government can play a particular role, um, apart from being part of the pressure to get that guarantee, as, 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 as you know, lots of Scottish opinion has been, is that then the advice to people who have not needed advice before EEA nationals will be needed. I think you will find employers um, very eager to help if they know what to say. And at the moment, they feel rather anxious that they have anxious employees and they can't reassure them and they're not sure what to say. So I think helping employers do it. But I think there will need to be targeted advice at the self-employed and at those in vulnerable employment. And here, I think local authorities and the Scottish Government nationally you know, would have a big role, I think, in getting the advice to people who might not hear um, you know, what the processes are. Thank you, Mr Donnelly. A few years ago, there was substantial pressure in the Conservative Party, at least to redefine and possibly even to abandon British membership of the European Commission on Human Rights. Um, all that we've had discussed in the past few minutes is pre predicated on the assumption that we continue to be a member of the European Convention of Human Rights. And I'd just like to say that that's not necessarily a, an absolutely um, cast-iron assumption. Yeah, but uh, uh, rights, uh, you could argue from a legal viewpoint that until when we can come out uh, and of the European Convention of Human Rights, if we come out, everything... Uh, the relationship before that moment would still be regulated by the ECHR, even if you have come out. So if the issue is that uh, you have the Home Office saying uh, Elena Spaventa needs to go back to Italy, my relationship up until the time in which we come out would be regulated by Article 8. So I would be able to rely on that 
uh, for all that has happened before. Uh, but I'm slightly less optimistic on the beauties of Article 8 because actually the European Court of uh, Human Rights has given a huge margin of appreciation to the uh, member states in matters of immigration. It's very, very strict. It's nowhere near as protected. And as, uh, as I think we remarked, this idea that uh, every single citizen in the UK would have to go to court to see basic rights recognized would be very disappointing and very, very costly. Uh, for everyone. Oh, no, I was just, I was just simply going to say, uh, indeed, that's that's so. But I guess part of my the, the thinking behind my question was around the the decisions the UK government has to make in terms of its both its treatment of citizens of other countries already here, and in terms of its approach to negotiations. And and my what I was suggesting was that Article Eight and those rights would influence the approach the UK government could take because if it took a, a, a particularly unhelpful approach, it would run the risk of exactly that kind of judicial chaos of, of courts filled with um, applicants claiming their rights under the ECHR. Can I ask the panel what they think of um, the possibility of the UK government reaching bilateral agreements with individual um, EU states? For example, we've talked about the number of UK citizens in Spain, for example. Um, is there any possibility you think that that might happen? Mr Kitwala. Um, what, what will need to happen in the, in the detail is that if the EU governments make an agreement that, you know, they have agreed to uphold the rights as they were, you know, if you, if you had this permanent leave to remain status that was sort of ex-EU and that was reciprocated, what you'd have at an EU level would be the commitment to implement that in national law. You would then need some you know, exchanges and scrutiny about the system of pensions uprating. I mean, we, we bilaterally do and don't uprate pensions on a bilateral basis. You don't get your pension uprated if you retire to Canada, um, for example, that you do for other countries. So, um, you know, there'd be a level of scrutiny, but I think you want the agreement at the European level about what, what the principle is that's being applied, and therefore you need some adjudication that everybody has done what they're, what they're meant what they're meant to do at the national level. So I think the bilateral um, discussion should be about implementation. I think a more dispersed bilateral agreement than that would be really rather difficult to work through. Yes. This, this bilateralism would imply uh, throwing away the idea of EU citizenship for the, for, for the member states of the EU. So, it, because uh, once we go bilateral, the presumption is that different EU citizens will get different rights depending on their association with the concrete member state of the EU, while all of them are here in the UK, the ones that interest us. So, I think there will be a strong, extremely strong aversion in the European Union to take this route, at least until the moment when, when Brexit agreement is reached. Because once the Brexit agreement is there, and that agreement will necessarily have uh, a lot to say about how, how free movement or how the situation of, of, of those who have moved is regulated. Once the, once the agreement is in place, probably in the future bilateral relations are possible, but not, not until the moment when, when all the key, key points are answered. So in this sense, I fully agree with you. Mr. Donnelly? I, I agree with that, that there, there's no chance of bilateral arrangements before Brexit. Um, and, and if there was hope, and um, th there is always a temptation in, in negotiators, if you're negotiating with a, a, a large group of other people to try and split people off. Um, and I'd be amazed if that isn't a hope residing somewhere in the foreign office where I, I used to be. Um, but I think that's a, a vain hope. Um, I think it will be a question of, of what happens in the final um, exit negotiations. It might well be envisaged that there will be bilateral relations afterwards, or it might be envisaged the contrary, that bilateral relations will be forbidden because the EU decided that they must be negotiated with the bloc even after Brexit. But I can't see it it's being a question on the table until Brexit has, um, uh, has, has occurred. Professor Barnard. Yeah, I, I'm broadly in agreement with that. I'd like to make two points. One, um, as far as immigration from third countries is concerned, while in the past that used to be a matter for uh, domestic law of the individual member states, there is a growing body of EU rules regulating uh, 
uh, immigration from third states. For example, there are rules on long-term residents, there are rules on family reunification, there are rules on uh, so-called blue card workers, so those are the highly skilled workers, seasonal workers, um, intra-corporate transfers. So there's increasing volume of EU law uh, on um, the position of third country nationals. Paradoxically, those rules will apply to the UK once we leave, albeit that we have opted out of those rules while we're in the European Union. Secondly, in respect of any bilateral agreements, you've got to remember the capacity issues, because, of course, as you know, if we come out of the customs union, uh, the UK is determined to do free trade deals. Negotiating a free trade deal um, is a... A, a hugely demanding exercise. We already know that the the most recent trade deal with Canada has taken, it slightly depends on how you c count, but up to nine years to negotiate. Um, and so if there's going to be negotiations of trade deals, that requires a vast quantity of civil service resource. And it's important to remember that the civil service, certainly in, the, in Westminster, is um, at its um, smallest level since... Um, probably the end of the Second World War. So there are serious capacity issues. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to have to wind up very soon. I just wanted to ask um, Professor Spaventer just to clarify something. Um, you said earlier that um, you uh, thought that EU law would protect UK nationals living in EU countries. Could you just explain what you meant by that, exactly how that would happen? Um, so, the, at the moment, UK citizens are protected as EU citizens, and they are protected because they have exercised a right granted direct, directly by EU law. Now, for me, it's, and I think I will make actually a bit more, I re, will refine this uh, argument, but for me it's unthinkable that someone who had EU nationality, EU citizenship, at the time of exit will just be treated as a normal third country national. And this is because of a quite complex legal and uh, uh, quite a complex body of case law but it's because when they exercise the right, they had a right. So a loss of that right in terms of European law uh, should be treated differently from how you would treat a Canadian or whatever. And uh, the reason why I think that is particularly true is because third country national family members, uh, so the spouse or the children of a, of a worker, keep the right to reside in the host member state in certain circumstances, even when the main right holder has left. So if I'm Italian and I bring here my Canadian husband, and then I decide I don't really like the UK anymore, neither do I like my husband very more, and I go back to Italy, my husband will keep in European law rights, he will be protected as a special person. He's not going to be treated as a third country national. Now, for me, it's unthinkable that when you think about UK citizens who have come exercising their own EU rights, and this uh, right changes because of a Brexit, that they would be treated worse than my Canadian husband. And this is because of a series of constitutional constraints and principles that the European Court of Justice and the European institutions have elaborated in the past 20 years. Now, I'm happy to elaborate more, but it becomes awfully complicated. <laughs> would, would, does Professor Barnard agree with that? Yes, and I think there, there's certainly, it, it's not straightforward, but I would also say that as a fallback position, um, British nationals who are in um, France and have been living there for some time, as a minimum, would be able to take advantage of the long-term residence directive, um, which gives rights to third country nationals who have resided for a long period of time in um, a third country, in, 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 in an EU country. Yes. Professor Kochinov. In the Netherlands, unfortunately, we have sad examples where formalism prevails. And the Netherlands went through a similar process of decolonization like the UK. And then Suriname nationals 
created on the 1st of January in the beginning of the 80s, I think it was 81, suddenly discovered they were, that they were treated precisely as, uh, as third country nationals coming from, coming from nowhere. So the history of their Dutch citizenship throughout their whole lifetime was absolutely ignored. And not a single court has done anything to alleviate this pressure. So then we had to wait for the ECHR to say a word. And there is a body of case law coming from Strasbourg that actually reminds Dutch courts, please take into account uh, the, the, the history of the status of those people. But if not the ECHR, the national system would not protect those people. And then, of course, it, it, it's not to disagree with, uh, with Professor Professor Spaventa, I do believe EU law will have a lot to say, but, uh, but probably this belief should be a little bit qualified. And then uh, building on what Professor Barnard said, uh, of course uh, the, the, the directive on third country nationals for long-term residents will help uh, to, to, to regularize as it were, the status of UK nationals who are resident in, in, in the EU. Here the trouble is, however, as EU citizens, they cannot lose the status. And the status of long-term residents of the EU can be lost as a result of absences, and there are conditions in the directive. So this status is not absolute, and it provides a lower grade of protection compared with EU citizenship. So in this sense, I think it should be one of the priorities in the negotiations to come up with actually, and here I probably disagree with you, with a better degree of protection already in the leave agreement uh, that, would, that would need to be granted to UK citizens who are now present in the territory of, of the 27 EU member states. Thank you. Just to finish off on that point, I don't know if our panelists can just say in a couple of sentences whether they think that this issue of rights will be settled under the Article 50 timescale or whether it's going to require some kind of transition period? I, I think the question for the people already there can be settled under Article 50, which is important because then it's done in the European Council by qualified majority voting and therefore it can't be held up you know, unreasonably by one partner you know, doing something tactical. Um, the key point, though, I think, is to press that it is settled right at the start before by declaration and on day one, um, because at the moment there's a block on sequencing of something that everybody should agree and that everybody can agree about what is the etiquette and the dance <coughs> of getting there. If the block is no uh, negotiation without notification, then we can settle all of it. On, you can settle the, the big point that people want to hear on day one. If the principle became nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, then everybody is waiting another two and a half years to get you know, something that is causing a lot of anxiety. Professor Spaventa? Yeah, I entirely agree that it is an Article 50 matter. If, you know, it's one of the main Article 50 matters because it is what to do with people who had exercised their own rights at the moment of exit. And I think there is no one amongst my academic and non-academic colleagues who would not wish for this to be settled as soon as possible, including employers and so on. Um, I think it would be very sad if uh, either the EU or the UK did not get this out of the way as the first issue. But then we live in very sad times, so I'm not so sure I can foresee what's going to happen. But. Professor Kochinov. I fully agree with that. And then uh, a the follow-up question is how much Article 50 will be used to define the future relationship. Because now it seems like among the institutions of the EU, there is a prevailing opinion that Article 50 is only, is only step one, and then step two comes the, comes the real agreement. And in fact, plenty of member states seem to disagree. So, so in this respect, Article 50 clearly can be used also to define the relationship in the future. And if that is done, then, then, then we can also have a long-term vision of, uh, of uh, what citizenship will, will entail for UK citizens and for the EU citizens in the UK uh, in, in terms of guaranteeing their rights already under Article 50. Okay. Professor Barnard, do you think it can be done in two years? I certainly think the, the point of resolving what is the situation for those who have already moved um, can be done in, um, in, within the two years. Oh, and of course, it's worth remembering it won't be two years because the negotiations will actually only be about 15 to 18 months because there's time needed to get it through the agreement through the um, European Parliament. I should just say as a footnote, we've talked quite a lot about position of people who've been here for a long time, so five years plus, 
What will be much trickier to negotiate is what about people who've been here for less than five years, um, uh, and uh, particularly people who are here on a rather peripatetic basis, um, who don't have a consistent uh, uh, profile of um, work or self-employment, um, and how will we operationalize the recognition of those people? Or do we take a very simple approach and say everyone who is an EU national or EA national who's here on a particular date um, will enjoy the um, rights of free movement irrespective of how long they've been here before? Of course, that goes against the grain of trying to control migration, but it would reduce the bureaucracy quite considerably. Thank you. Mr Donnelly. Um, I don't think most of the questions of future rights will be solved under the strict Article 50 negotiations, that's to say, concluding in two and a half years' time. I think there are elements that might be, might be fished out, and perhaps we've identified some of them today, but those will be the exceptions. Um, and I just would say that um, on both sides, from the EU and the British side, there are enormously powerful political constraints which might well lead to the sense nothing can be agreed till everything's been agreed. Paradoxically, I think that would be reflecting the strength of the EU position and the weakness of the British position. But by a, a different process of reasoning, they, they may come to a similar conclusion. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our witnesses today. Um, and we'll now have a short suspension.